as to count the numbers one through seven and conspiracy to commit murder 182.1 PC as to count number eight state uh, uh, offense uh, Los Angeles County case number A253156 prison having received a term of life with a minimum eligible parole date of 216 um, what we're going to do at this time, I, I know you've been through this several times. What we're going to do at this time is we're going to establish voice identification. And I'm going to start with myself. I'm going to state my name and spell my last name. Then we're going to go to my left. And eventually it's going to come around to you. And if you'd be kind enough, please also state your CDC number. Okay? Uh, my name is Tom Pierce, P I A Q U I N T O, Commissioner of Border Prison Terms. Carol Bentley, B E N T L E Y, Commissioner of Border Prison Terms. Manny Waterham, G U A D E R R A M A, Commissioner of Border Prison Terms. Stephen K, K A Y, Deputy District Attorney, uh, Los Angeles County. Patricia Tate, T A T E, Sharon Tate's sister. Barbara Jackson Gray, Legal Services Representative, C I W A C K S O N, Hyphen D R A Y. Jenny Cardenas, C A R D E N A S, I'm on board with the press conference. Officer Salon, S L O A N, security. Denise Schreiner, ABC News, S C H R E I N E R. John Shearer, S H A R A F, Technician for ABC News. Sam Painter, B A F N T E R, ABC Wendy Putnam Park, P U T N E M P A R K, attorney representing Ms. Cranwinkle. Patricia Cranwinkle, K R E N W I N K E L. My number is 8314. Okay, the purpose of today's hearing is to gain consider your suitability for support parole and arriving at a decision that will consider the commitment offenses, the prior criminality, and social history, as well as your behavior session commitment. We have reviewed your second file and prior transcripts. And we will be utilizing those to conduct today's hearing. Uh, I am going to incorporate by reference from the decision of the hearing held on 8 11 82, pages 2 through 5. Any objections, counsel? No objections, but I do have some initial objections on the record prior to the hearing beginning. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do, and just to, to kind of remind you how this proceeds, I'm going to be chairing this hearing, and I'm going to be talking about the life crime and your prior criminality, if there is any, and social factors prior to incarceration. Then we're going to go to Commissioner Bentley, and she's going to be discussing your activity and your conduct since you've been incarcerated. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Guadarrama is going to discuss your parole plans. The people of Los Angeles are represented by the district, Deputy District Attorney. He'll be given an opportunity to ask questions via the chair and to make a closing statement. As you, of course, you're represented by counsel today and should be given an opportunity to ask you questions and make a closing statement. And then I'm going to ask you at the end if you have any statement that you'd like to make regarding your suitability. But, uh, one of the victims next to Ken is also present today. And at the very last, she'll be given an opportunity to make a statement as it regards your suitability. Okay? If the law on the board of prison terms rules states that you are to be denied parole date if you're released or post on reasonable list to others. Um, there are certain rights that you are afforded, those being timely notice and the, the right to review your C file and the right to present relevant documents. I would ask counsel to present the rights to the men. Those rights have been met. Okay. Ms. Cranwick, you're also you also have the right to be heard by an impartial panel. Do you personally have any objection to the composition of the panel as it is today? No, I do not. Counsel, any objection? No objection. Okay. You will receive a copy of a tentative written decision today. That decision will be effective 60 days after the review. The trans uh, transcript and a copy of that decision will be uh, sent to you. You have the right to appear within uh, 90 days of the effective date of the decision. You're not required to discuss the matter with the panel. You're not required to admit the, uh, the offenses. However, the panel does accept as true the court findings in this matter. Okay. Uh, I'll get to your objections in a second, Council. I'm going to wait for time. Thank you. Uh, is there any uh, uh, confidential information that's going to be used? To... No, there'll be no confidential information used. Okay, what I'm going to do.
do is pass to your attorney a hearing checkbook. This is a list of documents that we utilize to conduct the hearing uh, so that we can determine if your attorney and the deputy district attorney are uh, utilizing the same documents. I've marked that exhibit number one. This checklist is general in its uh, reference to the reports and that type of thing. I can indicate that I have received uh, all items as marked. If there's the possibility there might be some individual items under those that I'm not aware of, but at this time it appears we have received all of the information. Okay, thank you. Would you pass it? Thanks. that I need. Okay, I just want to be sure that we're from the same set of documents. You've gotten board reports, is that correct? Yes, I've gotten the board reports. The only thing, uh, well, I have I have everything. I'm fine. Okay, thank you. Um, is the prisoner going to be speaking with the panel today, counsel? Yes, she is. Okay, uh, just prior to my swearing in the prisoner, I'll ask if there's any preliminary objections. There are preliminary objections. Um, our first objection is to the... Uh, uh, news media coverage of this. We are objecting into the fact that we consider it to be, um, excuse me just a moment, I'm going down the list here to make sure I give you the right words. Uh, it is destructive and uh, distracting and it is also producing a distracting sound, can produce distracting sound or light, and we are objecting on that basis. It is my understanding that no additional lights um, or lighting fixtures are to be modified in the boardroom. Uh, second objection is that we have had no notice, uh, advance notice that uh, the prosecutor or a representative of the prosecutor's office or a next of kin of the victim would be present at the hearing. We are unaware of whether there has been a specific notice to the board itself or whether uh, the, board, the notice to the board that the prosecutor and next of kin uh, has timely made the request. in my files to indicate I have not received any advance notice nor has Ms. Krenwinkle as to their attendance. So you're saying the deputy district attorney also? Yes. And the next can? Yes. Okay. Any other objections? Not at this time. Okay, we're going to go into recess then. It's uh, 9 10 and we'll call you back when we put it. Um, prisoner, uh, raise your hand so she may be sworn to swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give the truth and the whole truth. Thank you. As I understand the statement of facts on uh, August 9, 1969, the prisoner in the company of uh, client partners, uh, Charles Watson, the Linda Kasabian, and Susan Atkins drove to a uh, hazardous on Seattle Drive in Los Angeles. Uh, and thereafter, uh, as a result of their actions, five uh, individuals were murdered. Uh, uh, at that time, the prisoner was armed with a knife, and uh, crime partner Watson was armed with a 22 caliber revolver. Um, prior to entering the residence, uh, Watson uh, cut the telephone wires leading to the residence, and then uh, the prisoner and crime partners uh, climbed over a wall and uh, entered the uh, property. At that time, uh, victim number three, Steve Parent, apparently was leaving the property. He was confronted by uh, uh, Watson and uh, was shot four times. And then the prisoner and crime partners went into the residence and uh, the uh, victim in count two, uh, Frankowski, who was asleep on the couch. Uh, the victim in count four, Kate, was, who was eight months pregnant, was in her bedroom uh, talking with uh, the victim in count number five, Jay Uh 
the victim in count one, Abigail Folger, was in her bedroom. The victims were taken into the living room portion of the uh, residence where uh, the victim, Sebring, attempted to escape and was shot by crime partner Watson. And uh, after that, uh, there was, uh, I guess, a lot of confusion. Uh, people uh, running around, is that correct? Mm, yes. And uh, that, uh, thereafter, uh, the other victims were uh, attacked and killed. And uh, the uh, one victim told her ran out of the back door and she was pursued by you, is that correct? Yes, that's true. And uh, you stabbed her several times? Yes, I do. Has she made it out to the yard itself? Yes, she did. And what was she doing? She was running, she was running. Okay, was she clothed or? Yes. And how did you catch up to her? What happened when you caught up to her? I stabbed her. In the back? Yes. Did she fall immediately? Yes. Okay. How many times did you stab her? I have no idea. Or more than one time? Yes. Okay. And then at some point in time I would assume that she was uh, immobilized. Did she, she fell down? Was she moving? Um, yes. Okay. And was she uh, talking to you or groaning or what was she doing? She's saying stop. And you continued to stab her? Yes, and then I left and went and got text. Okay. Was she still alive uh, uh, when you left to get text? Yes, she was. Okay. But she wasn't able to move? Right. Okay. And what happened when you got text? He went back um, to where she was and he told me to go to the back house. Okay. And what did he do? He went over to here and I don't know as far as what happened then because I went out, I went to the back house. I see. Okay. Um, it says that uh, in total uh, the victims at that uh, location suffered uh, approximately 102 stab wounds. Did you stab any of the other victims? No, I did not. How about uh, Frykowski? No. Did, did you not. do anything to Frykowski? No, I didn't. Did you assist in tying him up or? No, I did not. Okay. How about um, Tate? No, I did not. Did you contact Tate? No, I did not. And uh, Sebring? No, I did not. Okay, you went to the back house at that yes. time. What did you do there? When I went to the back house, um, I stood there and I opened the door and I was supposed to look and see if anybody was in there and I just stood there and looked in. Was anyone in there? I never saw anyone. And I never went past the door. I just saw a lamp and I just stood there. So uh, the other members, uh, your crime partners, were in the house and you were at the back house by yourself? Yes. And uh, this was after you had stabbed Folger? Yes. And did you go back into the house, the main house? Yes. Okay, and what was taking place when you returned there? When I went back into the house, um, Tex was telling Susan to write something. Where? Uh, I don't really know because he was just telling her to write something. Write, was, write something? Yes. Did, did you know what he meant by that? Um, to put something on the walls, yes. Uh, somebody wrote on the wall and, and using one of the victim's blood uh, the term pig or the word pig is that correct yes did you see that done um susan did that before she left okay did you see her do it not really no you didn't do that no i didn't okay and then uh, at some point in time uh, i guess uh, all of the victims were dead or dying is that correct that's correct uh, did you know if all the victims were dead at that time no i did not were any of them groaning or talking or i don't remember hearing anything so I don't I don't know okay whose decision was it to leave probably a text but that's interesting I don't I don't remember who said let's let's go we all turn around and leave you okay so, so I want to meant I was turning around and going okay so uh, at some point in time it just uh, there was a decision either spoken or unspoken to to leave just leaving, yes okay and uh, 
the, the record indicates that at some point in time when you went out to the car, you indicated that you had hurt your hand because of the stabbing. Yes, I probably so. Did you make a comment similar to that? Yes. Did you, when you were stabbing Folger, you stabbed her in the back initially? I believe so. Did you ever stab her in the front of her body? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so now you, you've left the house and uh, then you went back to the ranch? Yes. With your crime partners? And did you meet up with any other uh, crime partners at that time? When we got back in, Charlie was there. And you're referring to Charles Manson? Yes. Okay, and he was at the ranch. Did you discuss this with him? Yes, kind of. I mean, I didn't... Um, I made a comment to um, Yes, and I, when we got back, he was standing there waiting for Tex. He was with Nancy, uh, with the, and we were there. And Tex and he started saying something. I was getting out of the car. And I went to the back house after that. You say you said something to uh, Manson. What did you say? I said they were so young. And what did he say? Nothing. Did he know that you were going to go there to do that? Yes, he had to have since he's the person that came and got me out of um, the back trailer where I was with some children. Prior, prior to going there to the residence, is that correct? He asked you to go with, you, with your crime partners? Yes, he came in that me out and then he told me to go and do whatever Tex said. Did he, uh, did he give you any other, any other instructions? No, just follow whatever Tex says. So then once you got in the vehicle and you were driving to this location, Tex was telling you what you were going to do? No, he never said anything until we were already there. Okay, so when you pulled up, is that the first time you knew what you were going to do? No, not until we were already across the um, fence. Okay, what did you think you were climbing over that wall for, or that fence? Probably to rob. Because that had been, recently there had been this push to try to get money um, so that we could go out into the desert. So we'd been, uh, uh, dune buggies had been stolen, and um, there had been people who liked stealing money. Nice. Now, uh, you left that residence and you went back to the ranch and uh, you stayed at the ranch in, uh, most of that day? Yes. And then on that evening, apparently uh, you left with your, with crime partners again, this time looking for a residence that you could uh, go to. Is that correct? Yes. Now, the, the crime partners on that occasion, uh, that was uh, Kasabian, Watson, Grogan, uh, Van Houten and Manson, is that correct? Yes. And who would you say was in charge of that at that time? Manson. Okay. Um, so Tex, Watson was there and Manson was there, but this time Watson apparently deferred to Manson in terms of leadership. Absolutely. Okay. And did you know where you were going at that time? I had no idea. Had there been a discussion about doing something similar or? Not until we were in the car. Okay. And, and then Madison started talking to him. And what did he tell you when you were in the car? He was going to go out looking for someone else to uh, kill. And how did you accept that with him when he said that? By that time, I don't think I was, I think I was pretty numb. What was the... From the previous time. Okay. What was the general atmosphere in the car where was everyone looking forward to going someplace or... Was there any uh, attempt by anyone to uh, change Manson's mind or to get out of the car? No, I think everyone was just pretty well being very docile and Manson was always was in control. And what were you thinking? Did you want to leave? As I said, I think I was completely numb. From? The night before. From the previous uh, murders? Absolutely. And, but you knew you were going to possibly commit some more murders and that's where you were headed and uh, how did that impact you just numb yeah i think i felt very very numb inside i felt very very dead inside and empty very frightened and um just completely kind of hollow did mr manson 
Jackson tell you why he wanted to go kill somebody else? That night, no. Did you know why? It's difficult to say exactly why Manson decides to do anything because it always changed. Um, and he was never, no one ever challenged any of his um, ideas or his philosophy at that time at all. Because I think that he, he had a feeling that there, we were under attack and that somehow or another that we were, that the ranch was endangered by people from the outside. And I think he felt, um, at that time, he felt there was supposed to be some kind of war. We were getting prepared to go to some hole in the middle of the desert. Um, we were trying to prepare for this uh, revolution that was supposed to take place. And all of this was combined amidst a lot of other, you know, ideas and whatever he had that they would change on a daily basis. But basically that was the theme. Who, who was going to declare war? Charlie felt that the whole, um, that the United States was in turmoil and that it was going to blow. And that there was going to be a revolution in the country. I, I did read somewhere uh, where there was some indication that uh, in, the murders may have been made to look uh, like they were committed by uh, blacks or to initiate some kind of a race war. Or Does that sound familiar? Yes. But one of the things is that he believed that and his biggest philosophy was those that are at the bottom will be on top. He used the he used the Bible to use that as part of that philosophy where what goes around comes around and the way he saw it from spending years in prison is he said those people which especially minorities who have been oppressed would be the people to eventually take over the country because they had been at the bottom and it was proved by the Bible was proved by, you know, all the philosophers of the world that whoever is, whoever is the bottom, whoever is the servant, will be the, you know, he used those kind of um, tactics, and so that's how he believed it would happen. Okay, I know we digressed just a little bit, and I appreciate your, your candor. Uh, so now you're in the car, and this is August 10th, uh, 1969, with the uh, folks that I already mentioned, your client partners. And uh, apparently uh, driving around looking for uh, a residence or a place where you could go to uh, to kill someone as opposed to burglarizing a house. Is that correct? Yes. The, the purpose there was to go yes. kill someone. Okay, so uh, ultimately uh, you went to the residence uh, of a family by the name of La Bianca. Okay, and those were the victims numbers six and seven in the, in the uh, charges. And... Um, Apparently, uh, Mr. Uh, Manson entered first? Yes, he did. How did he get in? I'm not sure how he got in, to be honest. I mean, I don't know if he went through the front door, if he climbed through a window. I know he went inside. And where were you at that time? In the car. And why were you staying in the car? Because I wasn't told to do otherwise. Okay. And did anyone else stay in the car with you? Yes, everyone else was in the car. So just Mr. Manson went into the house at that yes. point in time? So then eventually you entered the house. How did that come to be? He eventually um, came out and got texts, texting he went in for a while. Then he came back out and he told Leslie and myself to go in. Okay. So now the four of you are in the residence. Yourself, uh, Ms. Van Houten, Tex Watson, and Charles Manson. Is that correct? No, he never went back in after he sent us back in. I see. Where was Grogan? He, he was still in the car. In Kasabian? In the car. When you went into the residence, uh, did you see the victims? Um, not initially, no, because we came into the back door. Okay, when you first saw them, uh, what condition were they in? Mr. LaBianca was on the floor. Was he tied or just laying on the floor? He was tied. Okay, and uh, how about uh, Mrs. Mrs. LaBianca? Uh, La she was too. She was 
And at some point in time, Rosemary LaBianca was taken into the bedroom by yourself and your crime partner, is that correct? She was already there. Okay. Uh, and were you directed to that room? Yes. And somebody told you Text. there's one in the room? or Yes, text me. Okay, so you, you went into the room with uh, Ms. Van Houten? Yes. And what happened? Um, while we were in there, uh, Ms. LaBianca had um, a pillowcase over her head and we were trying to, let's say they were trying to tie her up, and I had a knife, attempted to stab her, and eventually she was struggling, and Leslie went out of the room and got texts, and he came back in, and we left the room. And on the way out, he told me to do something um, witchy, and then I went out into the front room, and I proceeded to get a fork and stab Mr. Avianca, who was dead, I assume. By the time on the stomach, I wrote um, with his blood on the walls in the refrigerator. Okay, let me back up just a second. When you were talking about Mrs. Uh, LaBianca, you said you attempted to stab her. Yes. Uh, what did, did you stab her? She was stabbed in the neck and the torso a number of times. Yeah, I attempted to with a knife I had. And, um, it just, it really wouldn't stab her. Uh, Did the, the knife wouldn't penetrate the body? Not really. How did she end up getting stabbed? Well, I know Tex went in and went and called him. So, he was the only one that you know, are, you, are you saying that you nothing. attempted to stab her? Yes. You were unable to? Struggling, right. Was she bleeding at all? I assume she was. Well, I, mean, I don't remember. Okay, so you don't remember seeing any blood as, no. as a result of your attempts to stab no. her? No, I don't. And you called Tex in. Did uh, your crime partner, Ben Houghton, stab her while you were there? No, I don't remember seeing her blood. Uh, Watson goes in the room and you leave the room with Van Houten. I, yeah, I left when I left and went out and I don't remember where Leslie was after that. Okay. Then you said you went into the next room and uh, <clears throat> you ultimately stabbed the male, Mr. LaBianca, yes. is that correct? With yes. a fork? Yes. <clears throat> and what kind of a fork was it? Was it, it, was it a fork from the kitchen. A regular kitchen utensil, not like yes. a barbecue fork or anything large like that? Yeah, it was larger than a regular, like, eating fork, yes. Like a salad uh, fork, um, a, a large uh, one you might use to toss a, a salad? Or, okay. Yeah. And how did you stab him? I stabbed him in the stomach. Okay. And uh, I, I know that in the past they've attributed uh, the, the writing of the word war on Mr. LaBianca's body to you with the use of the fork, and in the past I believe you've denied that at this period. Yes, I don't remember doing that. Okay. Stabbing with a fork, that I remember. How many times did you stab him? Maybe ten times. What was he saying? Nothing. Was he groaning? No. Okay, okay uh, now, uh, ultimately, there were numerous words written around the inside of the uh, president, uh, president. I'm sorry, residence. The word uh, helter skelter, the word uh, uh, death to all pigs, uh, and the words, uh, the word rise. Did you write any of those words? I wrote them all. You wrote them all. And did you write those uh, with the uh, the victim's blood, or how did you write them? Yes. And how did you affect that? Did you just walk over to the victim and put some blood on your fingers, or? Well, you left that residence and uh, went back to the ranch, is that correct? Yes. Did you discuss this on the way back? No, not really. Okay. At uh, any point in time, did you discuss the seven murders? No, I remember. Uh, how about uh, Mr. Manson? I assume he's your leader, he's out in, out in the car. Uh, what happened when you go outside? Does he say, is it all done, or we did a good job, or you did a good job, or... Was there any comments? Oh, he wasn't there. He had left. He had gone. I see. Yes. 
I didn't see him for a couple of days after that. I don't think. Um, I, I appreciate the, your comments on this matter up to this point. I am going to go forward, however, with the hearing. We may come back to this area, and one of the other commissioners might have some questions about the life crimes. Uh, right now, I'm going to go into the other factors, social factors, and uh, and prior criminality. Uh, counsel, unless you have an objection, it was my intention to incorporate by reference from the probation officer's report all of the general issues related to the prisoner's social factors. Uh, where she worked and uh, all of those uh, issues and uh, I was going to make a couple, couple comments uh, relative to uh, where she was born and uh, when her parents separated and things like that but rather than read each and every issue of the social issues into the record uh, unless you have an objection I don't if I could have just one moment to ask Ms. Cranwinkleson sure thank you there would be no objection to admit it into the record. Okay, and if there's a, if Ms. Cranwick uh, was the prisoner or yourself, uh, know of any real important discrepancies in the so social factors that you, you feel should be corrected, uh, then we can, you can just comment on those or something like that, being said incorporated. But I am going to just touch on some highlights in that area anyway. I just don't want to go through the whole social thing. No, that's, that's fine. Okay. Uh, you were born in Los Angeles. Yeah. Right, and your parents separated when you were about 14 or 15, and uh, your sister, uh, you had a, a sister named Charlene Mann who was uh, older than you, and ultimately uh, she became addicted to drugs and she died uh, when she was about 29 years old, is that correct? Yeah. She lived primarily with your mother? Yes. Okay. And uh, you did graduate from high school? Yes, from University High? Yes. Okay, and uh, then uh, in general you were on the road after a period of time and uh, uh, ultimately uh, you had you held several different jobs uh, and at some point in time you uh, quit the jobs and you had, ended up joining up with the Manson family. And I know that's kind of a synopsis of your life prior to your incarceration, but... Um, and the other commissioners may want to ask some questions about that later on. Um, we do know that uh, you started taking uh, uh, drugs when you were about 14 or 15. I assume those were prescription drugs at that time due to your having been overweight. The doctor prescribed some Benzedrine. Yes, that's right. And uh, ultimately, uh, uh, you started using illegal drugs. Yes. And uh, uh, you used uh, marijuana, reds, whites, uh, acid. Uh, Alcohol. Alcohol um, and other uh, marijuana derivatives, uh, peyote, and things like that. Um, it, there was some indication that, uh, as a result of having used the uh, LSD, that you had uh, taken with quote quite a few trips. Approximately 250, 500. And now. But when you were utilizing the drugs, or at least the LSD, and, and that was happening, you were taking, uh, showing the effects of the uh, the uh, drug. Was that primarily during the time you were uh, with the uh, family, or we'll call it the Manson family, for one of, with your crime partners, or was that prior to that? Because I know you did utilize uh, drugs prior to that to some extent too. Yes, prior to. Um Prior to Mr. Manson, I used primarily alcohol and marijuana, and then uh, LSD, uh, which basically just came out in 1965. I think that was, was the first time I'd used it about twice before I had met him. But that was really one of his choices of drugs that we used at the time that I met him forward and then a lot of the derivatives of, of from mescal and psilocybin and all the breakdowns that they used during that time and then marijuana and hashish opium. We used 
it also speeds the time between the stream, gut stream, and things like that. Um, in terms of your prior record, I know that you were arrested for possession of dangerous drugs in Ukiah that was dismissed. Yes, it was. Uh, and there was another uh, arrest for a grand theft auto in August of 69. Uh, there's no disposition on that, and I think that uh, may relate to the instant case. Is that correct? And I was dismissed, too. Yeah, and then you were arrested for this uh, matter that you've been incarcerated for. Right. Okay, what we're going to do at this time is we're going to go to the post-conviction factors. I'm basically going to be focusing, um, since your last Board of Prison Terms hearing, which was 11-5-1990, and, but if there's something that you want brought out, uh, or something that I've overlooked, be sure I've I came to CIW in April of 1971, and uh, you've remained in this institution since then. Your classification is zero, and you've never had any disciplinary crimes. Is that correct? Because some of the times they go on microfiche and they're not quite available to us, but you've never had any 115 or any 128A. I haven't had any 115s. Okay. I don't know if I've had any 115s. Okay, well, there's none reflected in the file, but sometimes they're back on microfiche and stuff. But, but that's uh, pretty remarkable that you haven't had any disciplinary. That's, that's unusual. Um, I've noticed that in self-help, you've been in AA and NA for a number of years, yes, and in the 12-state program. When did you first join that? I joined it after they released me from close custody in about 85, 86. Okay. Yeah. All right. And did you practice the 12 steps? Yes, I do. Okay. What did you put in your moral inventory? Well, when I started to go through the moral inventory, I started first by looking at all the factors and all the parts of myself that I found um, that were weak and the things which had led me to make the inappropriate decisions that I had. And I began to list all the... Um, different events throughout my life and the people that I had affected throughout my life. And I, I was curious, you said inappropriate decisions. Wouldn't you think they were more like disastrous decisions? Some were, but not every okay. decision. All right. What were some of the positive things you put in there? Well, at first I put nothing positive. Mm -hmm. It took a long time and it's only been recently that I've really been trying to find anything positive. And that's one of the things that I learned along the way with AANA and with doing 12 steps is that you have to go back and start trying to fill in some of the good things. One of the problems is we don't have sponsors, so not having individual sponsors, you have to just kind of work it yourself and make it yourself. But it was going back and then starting to try to fill in some of the some of the good points. And, and it's hard when I go back, on, because one of the biggest problems I ever had was being vulnerable and being naive. But at the same time, it isn't something that I want to give up forever. And I did. And so it's like trying to open that up. So when I write things down, and I have to go back and tell myself, it's okay again to be a little bit vulnerable, maybe a little bit, instead of trying to be absolutely controlling of it. I'm so frightened to give up even part of myself to something else. And that's probably the strength of doing any of that kind of writing where you sit and you start looking. And then you have to develop both sides and say, okay. And I've been trying to be a little more gentle with myself and trying to decide that maybe some of these things are worthwhile. Okay. What about making a man? How did you make a man? Well, when I try to do that, it's like, in a day-by-day -day basis, it's trying to involve myself in those things which I feel are productive, not counterproductive, that assist others, because it's just a way of atonement, and it's a lifelong thing that you're doing, and it's a day-by-day -day basis. It's trying instead of, it's, it's trying to give of myself where I can, trying to acknowledge the strengths I have and those strengths, trying to apply them here with whatever programs that are available to do good by them. Okay. I notice you work now, you're, you're a trainer? Yes. Uh, and you received exceptional work reports. What type of training are you doing? <clears throat> I'm a physical fitness trainer for the women who are trained here to go to fire camp. So what I do is I I work with the women first. <laughs> Thank you. 
Patricia Krenwinkel uh, hearing, W8314. Okay. Um, I get the women who are first endorsed to, um, to get them to meet a physical fitness standard that they must have in order to fight fires. We have three fire camps that are, uh, two of them are located in San Diego, one in Malibu. These women have to meet the fire requirement physical fitness tests in order to be able to go out and look at these camps and fight the fires as we just had all those massive fires. All our gals are out there doing that. And so it's, it's a good job. We have to teach them teamwork because we work as a team. Um, myself and the other trainers, it, the focus is teamwork and physical fitness. and. Um, because it's, a, it's one of the few programs here that, of course, requires not only physical fitness, but you need to be able to work and get along well together, and you need to have a really uh, good, a good philosophy about the people you're working with because your life relies on those other people in a fire situation. Okay, I've also noticed that you you uh, were a clerk too in the recreation. Right. Do you do that kind of work when you're not training, or are you always training? Oh, I still yeah, I still assist on that. That's okay. how I, I originally went to work as a clerk for Pat Kirshner, who's a head of recreation, but she's also head of the um, physical fitness training program for the CDF. So I I graduated from there, and also I kept watching and got become more and more involved training. And pretty soon I became a trainer. Okay, I noticed. In 1990, you received your vocational data processing. You completed that program. Yes, I did. Okay. And are you able to work on updating that? Because that's always changing. Right. It's a, it's available anytime you want to go and update, and you can go back into the program and all, right. all that. Uh, since your last hearing, you've been involved in American yes. uh, and the Wipers Orientation, um, the Life Plan for Recovery, and Dr. Glenn's Psychotherapy Group. Those are some of the therapy programs, and, and throughout your time in the institution, when you, because you've been involved in, in therapy programs, um, the life plan for recovery. You were in AA. How did? Because that's for substance abuse. Right. How did that enhance your? Um, it works on the 12-step program. It does. So, yes, it incorporates 12 steps and it incorporates some other um, other information on drugs. Okay. By large, it's 12 steps. And then, in Dr. Grimes' psychotherapy, are you still in that? Yes, I am. And is that a group therapy? Yes, it is. And what are you getting out of that? Well, I've been um, very candid in it. It's been a very good group. I think um, we, as a whole group, we've all been discussing our crimes. We've been discuss discussing who we are, and so have I. We've always been a very it's been a very good group. It's been ongoing and it's continued, um, which is a little different than most. Most of the time you can only go for 12 weeks, but because it seemed like all of us felt as a unit that we were getting somewhere to be able to discuss and feel comfortable at discussing who we are and trying to grow, trying to find a better, a better way of dealing with all of our problems, be they with family on the outside or within the institution. Um, the has been maintaining as a whole, and I've really enjoyed participating in that group. Okay. And I noticed some time ago you were taking some college courses. Did you get your college degree? Yes, I've okay. had my degree. They don't have any college classes here anymore. No, I understand that. But where did you get your degree? Because I didn't see that in 80, 80, 81. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I have, I have my Bachelor of Science degree from okay. Laverne. It's in a program. Okay. All right. And what, what was your major? It's um, Human Services. Okay. Uh, and then I guess I noticed that you took some college classes then after that. Yes. Okay. All right. And um, then since your, your last hearing and some of the other activities you've been involved in, back in January of 99, you were a dance consultant. Was that for a particular program? Yes, it was just something. Okay. Doing. And then uh, you've been involved in the walkathons for right. child abuse yeah. prevention. And you're still, and you have been active in the READ program, which right. is a tutoring program. Yes. Is that in the evening? Yes, it is. It's and is that a little program. different than the Yes, I Can program? Oh, Yes, I Can is. Um, that's a program that you help tutor people to get their GED. Read helps people to learn how to read. Most of the oh. skills are back from about fifth grade. Okay, so most of our readers are they're not 
grade education. I see. Well. So they're not even close to getting their GED. No, they need your just, training. Right. We're just okay. trying to develop word skills okay. and reading skills on a very basic level. And, and have you personally gotten a lot out of doing that? Oh, I've loved doing that. And we work with the Challenger series, which is what's used on the streets right now in almost every literacy program. So you work with people. We learn a lot. It's a great series. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then you were involved with the Labor Day barbecue and the annual Christmas, and also with the Women's Advisory Council. Are you still on that? No, I'm not. Okay. Right. But you did serve as parliamentarian yes. in '92. Uh, and then in, I noticed something about the outreach diversion. Right. What's that? Um, I belong to a program that speaks to youth about drug use. They come in the institution. Well, there's, it's, a, it's a program that works both ways. There are women that are allowed to go out into the community and they go out. Those people that are doing lengthy census, myself, that cannot get gate passes, we meet with them up in the visiting room. And they bring normally children at risk, um, children that have already had some problems. We get, sometimes we get adults, we get, uh, which is called PC-1000s, their court sent to the institution. Um, people that are already in trouble and they're trying to use this diversion program. And so what you do is you speak to them about drug use and uh, the cost and consequences of your actions. And it, normally the children go anywhere from 13. And then um, you were involved in the ESIK annual banquet. I guess you did some work on that. And then I noticed in uh, 1993 you were also um, in volleyball. Yes. Okay. Are you still doing? Yes.